Hallelujah. It is good to be in the house of the Lord and to worship his wonderful name. He is worthy of all honor. He is worthy of all praise. And you can bring up the lights. Thank you so much. Felix, do me a favor. Keep one for yourself and give one to Adrian. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. It is so good to be in the house of the Lord. And it is so good to see you this morning here as well. This morning, I want you to turn to the book of uh, 1 Peter, chapter 4. And uh, we're going to be reading, beginning with verse 12. 1 Peter, chapter 4, beginning with verse 12, if you'll have your Bible ready at that scripture. Thank you, Pastor Barajas, for helping me out with an interpretation. I really uh, appreciate that, brother. Amen. Bra Pastor Barajas brought a powerful message. Uh, we posted it a little late, but we posted it. It is up uh, now, and uh, hopefully the next ones will not be as late coming as that one was. Praise God. We're working on different little technical problems with our online producers, but we're slowly going to get them worked out, little by little. Amen. If I could put a title on my message this morning, I'd like to call it The Cost of Conviction. The Cost of Convictions. And if you don't know what a conviction is, a conviction is... Uh, a, a strongly held belief and it's very important that I make that distinction a strongly not just a belief but a strongly held belief that is part of your core I mean what you will stake your life on something that you believe down to the bottom of your soul you can't deny it a conviction usually is what forms the way we look at life and the way our behavior because it is formed by what is uh, a, a truth in our life that we believe with all our heart. But there is a cost to true convictions and I'm going to be sharing what that cost is because in the, in the Christian walk a lot is mentioned about faith and uh, usually when we talk about faith we talk about things that are not seen but things that are believed but there it's not a blind faith it's not just a leap in the dark that you just believe you don't even understand you don't even know what what you believe or how to put it into words but you just believe it <clears throat> and you hope that it's true <laughs> that uh, there's a lot of people that have that kind of blind faith they don't understand but somebody told them or they were brought up a certain way and they believe it even though they don't understand it uh, a belief uh, uh, faith is based on the Word of God. That's what the Bible says. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. Faith, godly faith, true godly faith is based on the Word of God. Not the Word of man, not our own personal opinions, but the Word of God. That's the faith that the Bible talks about. And uh, when you have that strongly held belief that you will not be convinced otherwise you be, you know what you believe you don't have to understand it all but you understand it basically enough where you could say this is what I believe and I will not move from this belief sometimes it'll not come cheaply to hold on to that belief sometimes there will be a price to pay uh, I mentioned the voice of the Martyrs magazine and people that suffer across the world for their faith. And we are beginning to see some kind of, of persecution and suffering, very light compared to other uh, places in the world, but we're beginning to see it in the United States of America. That is shocking to a lot of people. It's, I never thought I'd see the day. It seems like it just started happening very quickly because when I grew up and I'm 66 years old, I still remember in the fourth grade, I can even tell you the name of the teacher, Miss Jacobson. The school was Eloy uh, West Elementary School. And you know how we started the morning? We started the morning in the fourth grade with prayer. The teacher would say, let's stand. And students were going to say the Lord's Prayer. If you don't want to say it, you don't have to say it. Just 
just stand there, you know. But uh, the rest of us, we would close our eyes and we would actually say the pledge of uh, uh, the allegiance and then we'd say the Lord's Prayer. And, and this, this is in the 60s, not in the, not in the 20s, in the 60s. And, uh, and, and think about someone trying to do that today. Oh my, what a commotion it would cause. It would just drive people crazy if they try to do that uh, today. Hopefully we can get that working, sister. Uh, you got it working? If not, maybe one of the techs can help her get her translator equipment working. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> and that's what I'm going to talk about. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Let's go there right now. And this is what it says. This is Peter. Beloved, do not be surprised in, um, at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you... Uh, let me just move this microphone out of the way. Comes upon you for your testing. As though something strange were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ. Keep on rejoicing. So that also at the revelation of his glory. You may rejoice with exaltation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ. You are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Make sure that none of you suffer as a murderer or thief or evildoer or troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, very important, he is not to be ashamed but to glorify God in this name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? As it is written, with difficulty that the righteous is uh, saved. What will be the what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Therefore, those who suffer according to the will of God sh shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. He's telling them right there exactly how they are to face persecution, how they are to face opposition for the sake of Christ. Now this is very interesting coming from a man that I just mentioned earlier, Peter, that when Jesus was arrested, what did Peter do? He jumped up and he started fighting and swinging the sword and cut off the ear of the high priest servant. And that's the way he thought he could defend Jesus and, and do something for God by by fighting back and now he's talking very differently he's talking about not being surprised when you have difficulties being ready for it and and I will share toward the end some other things that he says about what our attitude should be but the part I want to zero in that he says uh, do not be surprised at the fiery fiery ordeal among you as if something strange some strange thing was happening to you don't look at it as, wow, where did this come from? This is so weird. I'm trying to serve the Lord and now all this is happening. All this opposition and all these problems. Pastor Barajas was mentioning this earlier in our time of prayer. And I'm going to say it again. Our country and our world is going through a huge societal, political and spiritual change. It seems that many things that we took for granted are now being challenged. Like I said, I remember when we started prayer in school. We started the school day with prayer. I remember when ministers were respected, when Christians, when things were asked of, of them that violated their faith, even the government said, respect that because we don't want them to violate their conscience and they respected that uh, your beliefs when it came to God there was a certain line that 
that people wouldn't cross or was that respect. I remember hearing a, a, a person tell me once, we were real bad thieves. We broke into houses. We didn't care what house we broke into. And we were driving around checking some houses we were going to break into. And then we drove by a church. And, and one of the boys said, hey, why don't we hit that up? And the other three said, are you dumb? Are you stupid? That's a house of God. We'll never break into that. God will see us and strike us dead. And they didn't. Can you imagine that people had that kind of, 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 of thoughts about God? But now all that is being challenged. It's beginning to cost to stand for or believe in something that people do not like. We can easily nowadays be labeled as phobic this and phobic that. You're, you're a homophobic, you're a transphobic, uh, and on and on they go with, with uh, that, you're, that you're scared of something that you don't understand. And they use that, la that label to mock you and to put you down as a believer and to misinterpret uh, what you stand for. The word racist is thrown around quite a bit in our days. If you disagree with someone and they're a different color, you're a racist. And, and, and I remember when people would get mad at others, I'd hear them on the, on the political argument, they're racist. And, and, and that word is just used, and I sometimes wonder if people even know what a racist is, they just throw it out there. Or, you're an extremist. You're an obstacle or an enemy to progress and change. We are experiencing a very hostile cultural pushback in our times like never before. And it seems like it is just unraveling even faster society at how things are now so upside down that they call right wrong and wrong right and bad good and good evil about. The only thing that is bad nowadays is to say that something is bad. That's bad. You shouldn't say that. This is a world that we woke up to one day and we couldn't believe it's happening right here in the country of the United States of America. A country that was founded upon Judeo-Christian principles. Let me give you just a few examples and I could give you more that would take a lot of time this morning. But some of these will give you the idea of what I'm talking about. Raymond, Dr. Raymond Dam. Damadian, if I'm pronouncing it correct, is the doctor that invented the MRI. The, uh, it's, it's a machine, big round tube where they slip you in. Uh, it's different from, it works different from an x-ray. There's no radiation. It's a very useful and uh, way of finding out if a person has a dreaded disease like cancer without even using radiation. It's used by millions and it saved millions of lives by beginning early treatment. A brilliant doctor and he invented this and at the time that he invented it he was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize because of the contribution of the MRI. But another scientist got the prize. Sir Peter Mansfield received the Nobel Peace Prize for his contribution, not for inventing the machine, but contributing information that was partly used in inventing the MRI. It really hurt Dr. Raymond the Midian, how he invested all this time and all this work and he was passed over on this prestigious award and it was given to someone else. Why was it given to someone else? Many believe, even doctors among his peers, that uh, this Dr. the Midian was discriminated against because he was an outspoken Christian. He had his favorite verse and every day he would begin the day with that verse. He was a young earth creationist. Uh, he believed God created the earth in six literal days and he 
was not afraid to share his faith with anyone that he would listen. He talked openly about God and he was seen like something. No, he is an academic. He is very sharp. He's very bright, but he's kind of wacko talking about God and religion the way he does. So there is a feeling that he was discriminated against because of that. That was the only thing that they could find that stood out against him. Isn't that terrible? This happens in countries every day like Pakistan. I was reading in the Voice of the Martyrs where Christians are relegated to the worst jobs possible. They're the ones that pick up the trash. They're the ones that clean up the sewer. Their kids are not given college opportunities and they're mistreated in school. And sometimes if they're robbed and call the police, the police do nothing about it. Sometimes they're chased out of their villages. And all because they are Christians and they love God. And you know what they do? They accept it and they worship of God and they go to church. I, I've seen videos of them worshiping God. You'd think they were here in the United States playing the guitar, playing drum, singing unto God. They don't care. They worship God. God is more important to them than all the discrimination and persecution that they receive. I don't know if you heard the story earlier this year of Julie Jaman of Port Sen, Washington. A grandma of 80 years old, an 80 year old grandma, she uh, liked to go swimming at the YMCA pool in Port Townsend, uh, Washington. It's uh, called the Mountain View Community Pool. And on July 26th, she went to swim the way she always swam there. YMCA, does anyone know what the YMCA is? What is it? What does YMCA stand for? Young Men's Christian Association. It was a Christian association. That's the way it started. <laughs> kind of reminds me of the boy clubs. Boys club. On July 26, she went to swim and when she came out she went to shower. It's a small pool. It only has two small areas for showering for boys and for girls. And she was showering and she heard the voice of a man in the bathroom. And then she looked out, she dressed herself up in the towel, and there was a man out there sitting down, staring at the young girls taking off their bathing suits. She yelled at him and said, what are you doing in here? You don't belong in here. You're a man. And he told her, that's none of your business. She tried to report him to the staff. She told one of the staff that was in there to go and tell on him. They came back and told her, you are discriminating against this man. And for, for that, you are banned permanently from this pool. Well, you know what? She wouldn't take no for an answer. She told that man, she raised her voice and she took authority. And she said, you get out of here right now and quit staring at those little girls. And for that, she was permanently banned from the swimming pool by the YMCA, the Christian Association. <laughs> well, I don't know if it's Christian anymore. Maybe it just has a name. She tried to get a little group of other grandmas together to protest what this, they had done to her. It was just a small group. And all of a sudden, a group of other protesters showed up, transgender people. They began yelling when she was talking. She had gotten a permit for a protest. She had gotten police for protection. But the people started yelling way above her microphone. And then they started pushing and they started closing in on, on her and her group. And it wasn't for other ladies that kind of made a circle around her. They would, have, they would have hit this poor old lady because they started pushing them around. They started crawling between their legs. They started grabbing their purses and everything. And the police wouldn't do anything until they yelled, we're being assaulted. And then they finally stepped in. All because this woman believes that God created men and he created women and they're different. And because of her belief, she was discriminated and permanently banned from the swimming pool. Pamela Richard is a Christian teacher in Fort Riley, Kansas. 
She was suspended earlier from her teaching position for violating gender ideology policy. In other words, when a boy wants to be called a girl and a girl wants to be called a boy, she said, no, you're a boy and you're a girl. I'm not, you can call yourself whatever you want to, but I'm going to call you what I know you are. I believe God created people like this and I'm not going to uh, give in to that. Failure to, they accused her of failure to use preferred pronouns and to inform parents even when asked about their, sec, their children's sexual identity confusion. You do not tell the parents if a child is gender confused and is thinking of getting gender transition operation. Even if the parents ask you, you don't tell them. She said, this is wrong. It's lying. She violated the rule. They suspended her. She said, "These are you're asking me to violate what I believe. And I'm not going to do it. Remember what I said? The time is coming for, that we are going to be challenged for our convictions. No longer respect for what your, your religious beliefs are. No longer respect if you, it means violating your conscience to do what they tell you. You have to do it. I know it sounds like I'm going political, but I'm not, because this involves our conscience as Christians, as believers. Extremist. The press secretary for President Biden was asked, what is an extremist? You keep calling people extremists. And you know what she said? She said, an extremist is someone that has a po uh, an opinion that is not popular. Someone that doesn't go with 90% of the people, what the people believe. They believe differently and therefore those people are dangerous and they're a problem for society. They're extremists. So if the whole world decides that we don't need to obey God, that it doesn't matter what the Bible says, it doesn't matter what you believe, this is the way we should do things, and you're a believer, and you say, no, I stand for what the Word of God says, what are you? <laughs> you extremist. That's what we are, according to some people. And these are just a few examples. Some people are already paying the price. How long before it happens to us? Our convictions and our practices should be biblical. We must decide if we truly believe them and then commit to them whatever it may cost us. What do you believe? Do you really believe it? And are you ready to stand for it even if you're criticized and persecuted and punished. As Christians, we've had it easy. We lived in a country that has respected up to now most of our religious freedom, but that's beginning to change. Look at what the Bible says. We're going to look at a few very important scriptures and then we're going to come back if you want to put something there as a marker on 1st Peter because we're going to come back to 1st Peter chapter 4. I don't care what the world says. Look at what the Bible says. Psalm chapter 1 verse 1 through 4. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. I don't care what counsel, intelligence, or knowledge the world gives me. The Bible says, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly of the wicked, nor stand in the paths of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree planted firmly by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and, and whatsoever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like the chaff that the wind drives away. Wow, those that walk and delight in the law of 
the Lord. Matthew chapter 7 verse 24 Jesus is speaking about two kinds of people. Those that hear what he says and say, oh, well I love Jesus. Jesus is a good man. Jesus had many good things to say, but that's all they do. They don't apply what Jesus taught. Therefore, everyone, this is Matthew 7, 24, who hears these words of mine and acts on them, uh, may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house. And yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house. And it fell, and great was its fall. Why? Because it wasn't on the foundation. It wasn't on solid ground. And that's what Jesus said. My words are solid ground. They're a solid foundation. Amen. Winds will come. Storms will come. But you will still be standing if you put all your faith upon the words of Jesus Christ. And you decide I'm going to live by them. I'm going to live by them. They're going to be my manual for life. James chapter 1, verse 22. All the way to verse 25. But prove yourself doers of the word, and not merely hearers who delude themselves. He says, don't just listen to the word of God and think that's enough, and fool yourself saying, hey, I'm hearing the radio, I'm hearing preaching in church, I'm reading preaching on different articles, and I even read the Bible. That's all great, but that's only the first part. He's saying, uh, prove yourself doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, but not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural faith in the mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he is. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, uh, the law of liberty and abides by it and having become uh, a forgetful hearer, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed by what he does. It's not in hearing the word of God. Hearing the word of God is good. We say that it's like getting spiritual food, but you've got to get it inside of you. And hearing the word of God and not obeying it is like sitting to eat a delicious meal and just looking at it and just smelling it maybe even taking pictures of it and sending it to your friends but never eating it it does you absolutely no good and finally Luke chapter 4 verse 4 famous words of Jesus he says and Jesus answered him talking to Satan it is written man shall not live on bread alone. And in fact, I'm going to read the next verse. And it says, uh, actually, it's not this verse. It's in another in Gospel Matthew. He adds, but by every word that proceeds forth from the mouth of God. In other words, the word of God. We need it for our life. We need it for our life. The Bible has something to say on every area of our life, whether it's financial, whether it's family, whether it's marriage, whether it's work. Uh, and so and on and on it's got something to say Christians are people who live by the book the book being the Bible this is our manual for life we choose to learn we choose to believe and we choose to apply scriptural truths principles and commands from the Bible to our lives and we filter everything that we do, that we believe, and that we proclaim, we filter it through the Word of God. What does God say about this? That is the way biblical Christianity is lived. But you know every day people look at us and think, I know you like the Bible, and the Bible is a good book, but it's so outdated. Times are changing. Get with it. What 
Nobody practices all that you're preaching. And sometimes they even point at Christians. I even know people that go to church that don't practice that. And there's even churches that are very liberal that they allow things that are clearly condemned in the Word of God. And the world picks that up and says, why do you follow that? I mean, there's, I know this church that they don't follow that at all. So what should be our response and attitude to opposition and trouble for the sake of Christ and for the sake of our faith? I remember talking to a friend of mine is Michael Wilhite from Bisbee. He was a worship leader at one time there in Bisbee Assembly of God. And we were talking about poll after poll that continues to show the majority of Americans call themselves Christian. And yet we see the condition the world is in. And I told him, you know what? That poll will always be high. Why? Because people don't understand what it means to be a Christian. But what will be low, and will get lower and lower and lower until it's a very small minority, will be people that not just call themselves Christian, but people who really believe the Word of God and live by it and apply it to their life. Even if they're laughed at, even if they're uh, opposed, even if they have difficulty because of their faith, even if they have to pay a personal price for what they believe. Amen. Those numbers are going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. I tell the story of me and my wife when we were going to get married. And we, I took my younger son that was going to be in my wedding to get a haircut at a, at a hair salon here. And the, la the lady cutting his hair said, What's a big occasion? And I said, I'm getting married today. She goes, you are? Oh, how fun! And I've said it here before, but this is a world mentality. Because it's so prevalent. It's everywhere. She said, how long have you and your girlfriend lived together? I said, excuse me? She goes, yeah, how long have you been living together? I go, we haven't been living together. But we're going to start living together. She said, what? I haven't heard anyone like that in quite a while. <laughs> strange. When did it become strange and weird to follow the Word of God? 20. The year 2000, maybe earlier, things begin to change. And I'm going to tell you things are going to get harder. And the devil is going to come and he's going to tell you, you can, don't take it so serious. Look, you've got to adapt this to the world that you live in. You know what happens when we do that? We give a little here, we give a little there, and we keep giving a little here, and we keep giving a little there, until pretty soon there's nothing left to give. We start down the slippery slope. And then we start to doubt the Word of God. We say, look at the world, God. I stand out like a sore thumb. Maybe this, can, maybe this needs to be reinterpreted. I want to tell you, the time is going to come where you might, be, you might really stand alone for your beliefs. And people will look at you. You are a prehistoric dinosaur because you believe those crazy things. Peter, going back to, and to finish off, going back to First Peter, he says, here's our attitude. He says, number one, when that happens, don't be surprised. Verse 12, that's what he says. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal for your face. What did Jesus say? He said, if they hated me, they will what? Hate you. They will hate you. We share, verse 13 says, we share in the sufferings of Christ. What does that mean? That means that whatever Jesus gets, we get a little bit of it too. <laughs> we share. 
Like I get a piece, uh, I get a big sandwich and I say, I want to share this with you. Jesus says, I get this big cup of suffering and I want to share some with you. We share the suffering. So don't be surprised. Verse 13 says, but keep on rejoicing. Rejoicing? How do you rejoice when you get picked on and laughed at? You rejoice because just as Jesus suffered and died and the Bible says who for the joy set before him endured the cross despises shame what was the joy set before him he looked beyond the cross he looked beyond the suffering to the result of his death and there was going to be many souls saved redemption for mankind and we look beyond what we have to go through in this life for what God has prepared for us in in heaven and when he appears a second time just like Jesus was vindicated through resurrection we are going to be vindicated through the second coming of the Lord we read about that a while back in Colossians when he appears it will be revealed who we really are so we know we belong to him because we're sharing number 14 keep this attitude it says you are blessed in the, right in the middle of verse 14, it says, If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed. You're blessed. Hallelujah. How? Because you are part of the family of God. You are marked with the, with the mark of Jesus. You're identified with Jesus. You belong to Jesus. And everything that Jesus has prepared is yours. You're an heir of God and a co-heir of Jesus Christ. You're blessed. Verse 16, don't be ashamed. If anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed. If you get laughed at, if you get persecuted, if you get mistreated and call names, yeah, racist, extremist, homophobic, transphobic, whatever they call you, some wild, crazy man or woman that doesn't know what they're talking about, wear it as a badge of honor. That you belong to Christ. If someone says, you're not one of those nuts that believes the Bible. Oh yes, I'm one of those nuts. But I'm attached to a strong bolt. Hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. You walk into a room and they're picking on Christians. And they're laughing about God. And the Bible was written by a bunch of old men that didn't know what they were talking about. And then you walk in and they look at you. Oh, you don't go to that church, do you? Yes, I do. I go, are you a Christian? Yes, I'm a Christian. One or two things happen. They stop talking or they pile it on more. One or two. Usually they stop. They don't know what else to do because they expect you to start apologizing. But you don't. Amen. I believe in God with all my heart. I, I live my life according to the Bible. And I will not be swayed. Don't be ashamed if you're suffering as a righteous person. He says, don't suffer for doing bad things. That you should be ashamed. If they arrested you for speeding, <laughs> they arrested you for, for taking something that didn't belong to you, yeah, be ashamed of that. But not as a believer. Verse 17, it says, remember God is using that opposition and that trouble as a purifier for the church. That's what he says. For it is time for judgment to begin in the household, household of God. God is shaking the church. You know how the church grew in the, in, in, the, in the time of the book of Acts? It spread and it grew when persecution hit. It was growing there in Jerusalem, but but it was staying in one place until persecution hit. When persecution hit, everyone scattered and wherever they went, they went preaching the word of God and the word of God scattered and spread everywhere. And the Bible says that as a result of persecution, not very many people wanted to get involved with Christians unless you were really saved. Why? Because it was going to cost you something. You're going to be an outcast. You're going to be mistreated. Are you sure you want to be a Christian? And finally, entrust yourself 
to God's care. Verse 19, therefore those also who suffer according to the will of God. Isn't that interesting? According to the will of God. It doesn't mean that God is saying up there, okay, I want some people to suffer, so I plan some suffering. No. It's that God uses suffering. And we suffer according to the will of God because we are following the will of God and we convict people and we make them feel guilty for their sins and since they don't want to repent what do they do they attack that person that makes them feel guilty and you suffer for it I'm going to give you a piece of advice that I used to give to some of, of uh, that I still give to new believers that start to encounter persecution and being ridiculed for the cause of Christ I tell them you know Think about it this way. Sometimes the people of the world don't believe that you're really a Christian because they've seen people that call themselves Christian but they don't act very Christian. And they're perhaps testing you, pushing your buttons, applying some pressure, see if you're for real. And when you crack they say there, see? He was not a real Christian. Amen. But when you stand for God, those same people that laughed at you and pushed you aside and didn't want to be your friends will be the people that when they have troubles and they have difficulty and their whole world is falling apart, guess who they'll come to? Hallelujah. They'll come to you and say, pray for me. I've seen it over and over. And the people that I've given this advice to have told me, yeah, exactly. They came and told me, pray for me. The same people that laughed at me and wanted nothing to do with me when they were having problems. So expect it. Don't be afraid of it. Rejoice in the middle of it. Consider yourself blessed. Don't be ashamed. Let, say to God, whatever you want to do through this trial in my life, do it, God. If you want to shake some things out of my life, if you want to reveal some things to me, that I need to work on, do it through this trial, through this problem. And then just commend yourself to God. Say, God, I put myself in your hands. Don't let me fall. Don't let me fail you. Don't let me be a, 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 a stumbling block to the gospel with my behavior. Let me be an example of a child of God to this world Hallelujah. that we live in. The time is here. The time is now. We don't know how much crazier this world is going to get. It seems like every time I hear bad news and I think it can't get any worse, it gets worse and worse. There are some laws that almost passed, thank God they didn't pass, but they got pretty close and one of them affected churches. There's others that might come and what are we going to do? How are we going to stand? What about when people say, that's dumb what you believe. I don't know why you believe that. Let me tell you all the harm it does. And that we can be patient with them and show them the love of God and tell them that God loves them. And is ready to move in their lives if they give him a chance. And stand firm. Stand firm. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Lord. We come before you this morning. God, we realize we live in a world like these examples of these people that I read, and they're just a few examples of people that are believers, they're Christian, and they already have paid a price for their faith. What about us, Lord, when we're put in a situation that calls for us to violate our convictions? Where are, what are we going to do? Especially if it cost us, if it cost us something dear. Lord, we, maybe one of the purifying things that this will do is that it'll make us loosen our grip on the things of this world that we've gotten so attached to and just say, take the whole world and give me Jesus. Nothing matters more than Jesus. Maybe we need to get there. Speak to our hearts, Lord. 
You promised to be with us, to give us strength. You've given us your word. You've given us your Holy Spirit. You've given us a church for encouragement and support. You've given us everything we need to live godly lives. Help us to appropriate ourselves with these tools that you've given us. To draw closer to you, Lord, and say, God, now I prepare myself for what may come. I want you, God. You and you alone, Lord, in my life. Be pleased with my life. Let me stand for you, dear Lord. In the name of Jesus.